From the Radio Cafe and the Kivira Coalition, you're listening to Down to Earth, the Planet to Plate podcast. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domandi. We're talking all about regenerative agriculture, about fixing our broken food system, mitigating climate change, and all sorts of good things for the health of the planet. Today, we're going to be talking about a new book, which is about pastoral people. That means people who herd animals across the landscape and what they can teach us about healthy land, animals, and people. That's right after these brief announcements. The Kivira Coalition is excited about a busy spring lineup of in-person and virtual workshops. There's an ongoing monthly new webinar series being produced by the New Agrarian Program. It's called the New Agrarian Toolkit, a webinar series to dig deep and level up on a variety of helpful topics. There will be a spring gathering out at Red Canyon Reserve near Magdalena, New Mexico on May 6th and 7th. This is followed soon after by a land health and history workshop held out in Abiquiu, New Mexico on the 20th and 21st of May. Then finally on June 3rd, there's an introduction to aerated static pile composting and vermicomposting happening in Santa Fe at Reunity Resources. Find out full details on all of this at kiviracoalition.org slash events and kivira, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. This program is sponsored by the Greenhorns. Listeners to Down to Earth might enjoy the newly released sixth edition of the New Farmer's Almanac, a literary miscellany written by and for working agrarians. This year's volume is titled Adjustments and Accommodations, and it's full of essays, poetry, and images that explore how people are facing challenges and uncertainties on the land. Learn more and order your copy at greenhorns.org. This program is sponsored by the Agrarian Trust. Agrarian Trust is charting a new path forward for the land trust movement. They're advancing an innovative and robust model of land ownership in which agrarianism, social and environmental justice, community well-being, and the earth itself are all seen as fundamentally intertwined. They're doing this by helping regenerative farmers and ranchers to secure long-term affordable leases. That helps to strengthen local food systems and to transform community relationships to the land across the country. Visit agrariantrust.org to learn more. And now to our program. It's a real pleasure for me today to introduce Ilse Köhler Rolfsen. She's a doctor of veterinary medicine. She's an author. She's an activist for pastoral cultures all over the world. She's spent the last 30 years living among the Rika camel herders in Rajasthan, India. Her new book is Hoof Prints on the Land, How Traditional Herding and Grazing Can Restore Soil and Bring Animal Agriculture Back in Balance with the Earth. And this book is published by Chelsea Green Publishing. And if you go to chelseagreen.com, you can get a 35% discount for listening to this show if you use the code CGP35 at checkout. And I have to say, it is just a wonderful book. It's really a pleasure to read and, and so informative. So definitely check it out. Meanwhile, welcome, Ilsa, to Down to Earth. Yes, thanks so much. for. Uh, I really look forward to this interview. Great pleasure. So this is a book about pastoralist cultures, which have very deep historical roots worldwide. How do you define pastoralists? Where have they traditionally lived? And where do you find them today? So there are actually many definitions for pastoralists, and nobody seems to agree. But we define them as people whose main income comes from keeping of livestock, So they depend on livestock for the majority of the income and they keep them in mobile systems and they usually don't own the land that the animals graze on. And in addition, what I find very important part of the uh, definition is that they have a social relationship with their animals. So pastoralism actually is very widespread and Currently, most of the pastoralists live in Africa and in Asia, but pastoralism was also very important in Europe, and it still is in parts of Eastern Europe and in places like Romania and places like Spain. So it's actually, it's a global phenomenon that hasn't gotten enough attention because our whole thinking, our worldview is determined by people who live, who have sedentary lives or who are farmers, basically. Right. And even on the North American continent and where I live here, I live in New Mexico, and there were Navajo pastoralists. 
Yes, quite right. The, the Navajo are an example of North American pastoralists. Although I think they came to pastoralism fairly late after the Spanish came because it's from them that they adopted the sheep. So they, as far as I know, they totally changed their kind of their identity even after they became familiar with sheep. And the Navajos, they became pastoralists and they started breeding the sheep for, for wool production and so on. Whereas I think other Native Americans, like they hunted sheep, but the Navajos became pastoralists. Interesting. So are these cultures always nomadic? I mean, you write about people who are going to food sources when those sources of food are most nutritious. So it really involves knowing where to go and when to go there. Yes, yeah, so there are different degrees of mobility among pastoralists. So here in India, for instance, we have also people who go, who just take their animals out. They live in a village, but every day the animals go out for grazing into the forest or onto the fields and they come back at night. And then we have other sheep pastoralists, for instance, who are continuously on the move and they go over long distances. So if you have like large numbers of animals, then there's usually a larger degree of mobility associated with that. Then here we have the camel pastoralists who also they, at certain time of the year, they may stay in one place for a few weeks or so, but the rest of the year they, they are continuously moving almost every day. And it just all depends on the availability of grazing. So during the rainy season, there may be a lot to graze on, so there's no need to move that much. But, you know, pastoralists can also be very much integrated into the agricultural cycle. So they have to, at certain times of year, when the fields are being cultivated, they have to move away from the fields. And then when the, when the fields have been harvested, they go back there in order to fertilize them. So this is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to uh, define pastoralism, because it comes in so many variations. Well, one thing that they all have in common is the process of, quote unquote, domesticating animals. But that term domestication isn't necessarily what a lot of us might think about when we hear domestication, namely the subjugation or domination of animals for our purposes. There's something which seems a lot more egalitarian in the different pastoralist cultures that you describe. Yes, that's that's quite right. I think this view of domestication as domination, exploitation and subjugation is a Western view. And in other cultures, for instance, in Central Asia, it's much more, not just in Central Asia, actually, among most pastoralist cultures, the animals are looked at as on the same level. They're not below humans. They're on the same level and it's a kind of an equal relationship where both partners in the relationship have to coordinate each other and communicate with each other. And pastorals are characteristic for them is the fact that they listen to their animals and the animals show them, they communicate when they want to move or what they want to do. And the pastorals normally they comply with that. So it's a totally different way of looking at animals, not as our objects, but as partners in life. You know, the antithesis of that is this idea of animals as production units, and they're almost like a me it's the mechanistic view of inputs and outputs and what we're putting into the animals and what we're getting out of them, and there's a lot of dollars or, you know, money involved in that. And it's not that, that pastoralism isn't a way of life with its economic aspect, but, I mean, you describe this very deep animal communication in both directions. I mean, people talking to and singing to their animals, to playing with them and being with them in a very physical way, in a very nurturing way when the, the animals are babies and people's children and, and the little animals all growing up together. And I mean, that's a, a whole different way of being. And it creates a culture that's a very, I mean, maybe some of us have that with our dogs or something like that. But this is a, it seems like a very deep thing. Yeah. And it's so, I mean, dogs, you have a relationship with your dog 
and that's one just one animal but here pastors have relationships also with herds and the herds are composed of different maternal lineages you know of offsprings of, of female lines that may have been together with the human family over many generations and they know so they know each other and they know the traits of every individual maternal lineage in their herd so it's a relationship that has been built up usually over many, many generations. And that's very different, very, very different. I mean, what does that look like in places that you've lived? You've been in India for the last three decades. I mean, tell us some stories about what you've seen. Yeah, I, I just see that, I mean, the welfare, the well-being of the animals is just top in people's minds. Everything re- revolves around the welfare of the animals and It's also emotionally very, actually it can be very draining. You know, if you have a lot of animals, uh, one of them will always be sick maybe, and that preoccupies your mind. But I think that continuously being exposed to that cycle of birth and death, it's also what makes pastors more humane in a way, because they understand nature and the cycles. So they are so far away from this mechanistic view of, that we have in modern animal science that is being promoted as being the most efficient and therefore the best for the world. So if you are with pastors, you are, I think you're continuously impressed by their humanity. That's, that's why and I enjoy their company so really very much. And ironically, people in the modern world tend to call them backwards. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. I mean, that that is... Yeah. Yes, they may not have a lot of the things that we have in the modern world. They live a very basic life usually. But I think this is basically it should be the way of of the future of making do, you know, of being less materialistic and of putting more, more emphasis on the really important things of life. And we call ourselves humans, and we need to maintain that relationship with animals and with nature around us. And I think that's what's gone wrong in our world. Everything is metricized and everything is predicted, and we go for precision farming. And the essence of pastoralism is actually to be flexible and to be able to deal with uncertainties and then to adapt accordingly, continuously according to how the external environment changes, not just climatically, but also in terms of, like here in India, I see how everywhere there's so much development, so many roads are being built and cities expand. So it all goes at the expense of open land, but still the pastors, they manage to kind of hopscotch between, you know, the different areas where they can take the animals for grazing. You know, and it's that flexibility that we humans also need in order to adapt to the future. We've seen how many things can go wrong during the corona crisis and how the slaughterhouses didn't operate anymore because the pigs couldn't be slaughtered in time and then they didn't fit into the machinery and all that. You don't get these problems with pastoralists. I mean, there's no need to slaughter animals at a particular time. I mean, you just let them live longer. You don't sell them. I mean, everything is flexible and adaptable. And it's these qualities that are important for humanity as a whole in the future. How did you get interested in this whole topic and end up in India? Yes, well, that's that's a long story. So I, I grew up with animals, with horses, typical horse girl and all that. So I studied veterinary medicine. And once I had finished, I had my degree. I was supposed to be a veterinary doctor. I really realized that this wasn't a job for me because the farm animal situation was already going uh, even in Germany towards more industrial systems. Everything I had to do was to do artificially inseminate cows. I wasn't very good dealing with pets, not the pets themselves, but their owners. And I also loved horses. I was very intrigued by racehorses because the thoroughbred horses are so beautiful. But what finally turned me off was when I went to Kentucky on one of the famous thoroughbred studs. And I saw um, how these beautiful animals were just being uh, exploited, basically. And, you know, they were raised at a very young age at the age of two years and then they were kept on painkillers and continued to race and then when they were two years old they were already going to the knacker so I just had a total identity crisis and I I knew I had to do something different with my life and I got interested in archaeology 
and worked as an archaeozoologist on a site in Jordan. And that's where I fell in love with camels because there was a Bedouin camel herder passing by every day and he had this big herd of camels and he was singing to them and they were very obedient. And it was just such a, it just struck me. It was just harmony between people and animals. So I got really interested in camels and started researching about camel pastoral societies. I did my PhD on camel domestication. And after like 10 years working as an archaeozoologist with just with the bones of dead animals that had been dug up by archaeologists, I uh, wanted to work with living camels again. And I got a fellowship to India to study the local camel socioeconomic system. And that's where I got really engrossed when I met the Raika for the first time. I just felt it just drew me in and I was fascinated. So here I am, 30 years later, and I've seen this culture, actually, this amazing culture, unravel on, on most levels, really. When I first came, almost all the Raika were having herds and uh, looking after livestock, and now only a small proportion of them are. Most of the young people work in the cities, and so a lot of knowledge has also disappeared. But we are here locally trying to revive camel herding by having set up a dairy for camel milk and we promote the concept of cruelty free and of compassionate milk and that's led to a local revival in uh, in camel keeping absolutely yeah very interesting i mean you were you wrote in the book about how yeah a lot of children of pastoralists end up going to the city but then during covid some of their jobs dried up and they came back to their families and to their culture, and they kind of decided, at least some of them, that they liked it better than doing menial labor in the city because they had a sort of freedom and there was a beauty to their lives that almost they had to go away from it to recognize how good it was. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, you have, we, we had quite a few young people come back. There's also a system in the community that if somebody wants to start a flock of sheep again, then all the relatives, they share a few animals and then you can build up your herd, your own herd again. So so that happened. And yeah, I talked to several of these young people and they like it because they're their own boss. Nobody's telling them what to do. Whereas when they work in the cities, they have to work, you know, like 18 hours a day under very horrid circumstances. And here out in the rural areas, it's much healthier to live and also there's actually good money to be made if you keep sheep and goat because the, the meat prices are high. So so there are a lot of advantages to the pastoral way of life. That the, the problem that people see is that it's not respected, that it's just not giving uh, being given respect. And it's also it's because of the land issues, uh, the grazing land disappearing, the forest being closed off. So it's a lot of hassle to continuously find uh, grazing for your flocks. You're listening to Down to Earth. We have a little announcement. We'll be right back. The Kivira Coalition is excited to partner with the upcoming Old Salt Festival on the Mannix Ranch near Helmville, Montana. Join us in the beautiful Blackfoot Valley from June 23rd to 25th to celebrate ranching, wild landscapes, and the relationship between agriculture and conservation. Over three days and two nights of camping, we will enjoy incredible food, 14 bands, and a speaker lineup that includes David James Duncan, Deborah Magpie Erling, and Ed Roberson, who's been on Down to Earth. He's the host of the Mountain and Prairie podcast. Learn more and get your tickets at oldsaltcoop.com, and co-op has a hyphen in it, oldsaltcoop.com. And now back to our program. Let's talk about the land a little bit. The kind of land that pastoralists graze their animals on is land that basically is not suitable for growing crops. You know, grassland, rangeland, shrublands, things like that. These are lands that are often overlooked or left out of discussions on climate change, where you hear a lot of people saying, oh, we have to eat plant-based diets. But these are lands which constitute a, a very large part of the terrestrial mass on our planet that are suitable for animals. Talk about that. Yes. I mean, this this comment is always, you hear that all the time by people like George Monbiot, that livestock take 
up too much land. But that's not the fault of the livestock. The reality is the fact that two thirds of the world's agricultural land can actually not be used for growing crops. It can only be used for food production by means of livestock. And this land where you can produce food even though crops cannot be grown, that that includes a lot of different types of ecosystems. And it starts with the the Arctic area, northern Russia and, and Siberia, where you can only keep reindeer who can actually, even if the land is covered in snow, they can dig out the, the lichens between the snow. And so even up there uh, where nothing really can grow, you can produce food by means of reindeer. Then if you move further south, you come to the the Gobi Desert. That's where you have two humped uh, Bactrian camels. And then further south, there's the Himalayas, where you can produce food by, with yaks who are adapted to high altitudes. Then in India and in Pakistan, in over South Asia, buffaloes are really important. Water buffaloes are an important source of food. Sheep, goat and cattle, we have... Everywhere in the world, we have the one-humped camel that's in the what's called the Old World Arid Zone Belt, stretching from Mauritania to here, the western part of India. And then in South America, in the Andes, we have the New World camel, it's the Yama and the Alpaca. But that's not it. I mean, there's also in parts of China and in parts of uh, India, there's pig pastoralism where pigs are grazed or herded over uh, harvested fields and they suck up the rice kernels that uh, escape the harvest. And in South India, we even have duck pastoralism where people take yet like huge, uh, I don't know what they call it, flocks of ducks uh, also over longer distances. There's one culture you wrote about that actually worships wolves, even as the wolves are eating their animals. Yes, that's right. Uh, that's here on the, what's called the Deccan Plateau in central India. Uh, there's the Kuba uh, is one group and another group is called Danga. And yeah, they are sheep pastors and they do worship the wolf and they appreciate the wolf because it eliminates the sick animals from their flocks. So they, they think the wolves keep the sheep flocks healthy. You know, that's that's their way of thinking. And they, yes, they do. They even they bury wolves and they make little monuments and temples for them. So this is, again, I mean, this is another aspect of how pastels relate to their surroundings and to wildlife. And here where I live, leopards, there are a lot of leopards here and they regularly eat little sheep not just little sheep, I mean, they love goats. And they've also recently started to actually attack some uh, some baby camels. But the Raika, they accept that. They, they say, I mean, the leopard also has to eat. Or they say things like the leopard got it in writing from God that he can sometimes eat some of our animals. So there's this acceptance of all animals being part of the world. Yeah, and, and I mean, it fits into this whole idea of agriculture, pastoralism, and sometimes ranching, as we will talk about, as a kind of biomimicry. In other words, looking at the way the natural world works and doing something pretty close to that. Yes, exactly. I mean, and that's the important thing about pastoralists, that they, they mimic, in a way, the migrations of wild animals. So it's, again, that totally this different uh, worldview of not uh, subjugating, you know, the earth and nature, but uh, going with the flow and mimicking the natural systems. And that's what we need. That's what we need to do for the future. Talk about the way animals in these pastoral herds and flocks help the landscape stay healthy, help farmers' fields stay healthy, things like that. Yes, so you don't find pastoralism just in areas where crops cannot be grown. In India, they are also very much integrated into the rest of the agricultural system. So you, we find we have them in heavily cultivated areas as well, where they play an important role in, in fertilization. So they actually a major source of, in, or even the major source of income for pastoralists are often by means of manure the animals deposit directly on the fields. And that help that is so important, apparently, from what I have heard 
the soils they don't respond well to chemical fertilizers in that organic manure in order to stay healthy. So this is an amazing service that these pastures provide to India's soil fertility. And apart from that, earlier also they were the pastors were also producing a lot of the uh, before tractors, and even now they were producing all the the bullocks that are doing the agricultural labor. So India without pastoralism is not going to it's not going to go anywhere. I think it's so important for the country to appreciate the role of its pastors in securing present and future food security. Another example that I thought was so interesting was there's this thistle that farmers hate that interferes with their growing their crops and the camels love it. And so the farmers are happy when the camels eat the thistles and then the camels, when they eat the thistles, produce the sweetest milk. Yes, that's that's right. Yeah, there is this, it's called the Indian globe thistle. It's a big thistle that, I mean, it grows about a meter high. And it grows when the fields are lying fallow between a harvest. And it's very bad, obviously, for the farmers. And the camels, they just love that thistle. And they go in there and they clear it out and they transform it into, as you said, the really sweet milk. And at the same time, they're also manuring the fields. So it's just a quadruple win situation for everybody, for the farmer, for the Camels for the camel herder and also for the people who then drink that really healthy milk because the thistle is also known for its medicinal properties. So I'm pretty sure even though we don't have the, the lab results or medical studies to prove it, but I think that milk that's produced from camels eating those thistles, I think it does wonders for a lot of afflictions. And we do use our camel milk here as locally uh, very much in demand for treating a number of diseases. So it's internationally camel milk is promoted for autistic children where it, and it helps. I think it it's not a cure for autism, obviously, but it uh, makes the children calmer and they establish eye contact and they sleep better and sometimes they even improve their verbal uh, qualities. So that's what, I mean, the, the global interest in camel milk relates to its positive effects in many cases for autistic children. It also is scientifically proven to be very good for diabetes patients because it, it lowers the blood sugar level. Again, it's not a cure, but it definitely makes a difference. But we've also seen here locally people with tuberculosis who were given up by doctors after drinking camel milk for you know for several months. They're, they're like back to normal and can do agricultural work again. For children with asthma, and autoimmune diseases and even cancer. I mean, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence about the positive effects of camel milk. We don't have any clinical or uh, double-blind studies or anything because nobody's taking an interest in doing those, uh, but there is definitely something there. And I, I think through camel milk or through the milk in general produced in pastoral systems, you get nutrients in your diet that you don't get anymore in the processed food that most people take. So uh, we always just, when we look at uh, diets, we look, you know, and, and what's described on the back of the package is protein and fat and calories. But there is so much more to food. There are these phytochemicals, which are uh, very important for maintaining your health, which are uh, up to now, I think they're ignored and they maybe haven't been fully explored yet, but they are uh, more than a thousand ph phytochemicals have been identified and they, uh, they are also necessary for human diets. And if you don't get them in your diet, you don't feel satisfied and you, uh, you don't feel full basically, and you keep on eating. Whereas if you eat food with, that are rich in phytochemicals, you, you become full very fast. Yeah, the idea of empty calories. Em exactly, empty calories. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And there's that amazing research going on by a professor in, in the USA, I think in Utah, uh, Dr. Stephen Van Fleet, who compared the composition of beef produced on a ranch in a really biodiverse system with that produced in feedlots. And he says that the beef, they're both beef, but they are uh, totally different substances like apples and oranges almost uh, in terms of their composition. Yeah. Well, I can attest to that. If I eat uh, factory beef, I don't feel well. And if I eat regeneratively produced beef, 
it's fine. So, and there's, I think a lot of yeah. people are experiencing that just in their own lives. Let's talk about the the lives of pastoralists today. I mean, there's a lot of conflict between, as you say, between pastoralists and the modern world for a lot of reasons. And one of them is, I mean, you, you said at the beginning, they graze on land that's not theirs, common land. Well, there's so much privatization and so many more roads being built and corporatization of land. So there's just land, less land for them to use. Tell us about the challenges that they're facing in India and in other places. So India has a lot of forests, and traditionally the pastors also graze their animals in the forest. And they had they had grazing rights in the forest under the uh, Maharajas before the British came in. And then uh, when the British <laughs> colonized India, they of course they wanted for one thing they wanted taxes. So and the mobile people couldn't be taxed because they didn't own any land. So they tried to stop people from migrating and uh, sedentarize them and they declared many of the pastoralists criminal tribes even. And at the same time, they started to manage the uh, forest for timber. And they, since then, I think there's this dialectic between the forest has to be protected and the uh, pastors can't go in there and domestic animals are bad for the forest and they destroy the forest and all that. So this tussle is going on, has been going on here since ages, and it's very difficult to see how it can be resolved. Even though a lot of the, you know, I mentioned earlier that there are a lot of buffalo cultures in India and they are forest-based. One example of them are the, the Van Gujars, which are a group of people who have uh, buffaloes and they, in the winter, they are with the buffaloes down in the foothills of the Himalayas and in the summer they migrate up to the alpine pastures. And they have had a lot of problems also with trying to be kicked out from the forest, even though they know how to, in, in their area, there, there are a lot of tigers there. And these one Kuchas say they can even cope and get along with tigers in the same territory. But in some all over India, the forest pastoralism issue is a, is a huge one. And it's one that's predominant in the minds of pastors. They want to have access to the forest. Definitely during part of the year, during the monsoon season, when the fields are being cultivated. So they have to, at that time, they have to move off the fields. And the only place where they can go to is the forest. I mean, one of the ironies is that even though pastoralists are such great land stewards, they're getting kicked off their traditional grazing lands by people who were building conservation parks, and yet they could yes. play a great role in conservation. Yes, that's right. There's a great conservationist in Spain, Mr. Jesus Garçon, and he, he, I think he expressed it most beautifully. He, he said to me, if you have pastorals, you don't need national parks. And Unfortunately, that is the case that because pastors, they don't till the soil, they don't use chemicals, so their areas. So the areas where pastors manage their animals, they look like nature, even though they are not nature. I mean, they have been influenced by humans and by, by livestock, but they look like nature. Those are, you know, the, the word pastoralist or pastoral already, you know, it has some kind of a romantic notion to it. So the areas managed by pastors are the few areas in the world where, you know, that really look like nature. So then they become attractive for conservationists and they decide to put up a national park and then they kick out the pastoralists. I mean, this is a phenomenon all over the world, unfortunately. That has to change so urgently. At the last conference of the parties to the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity at the end of last year, a decision was made that by 2030, 30% of the land, of, uh, of the terrestrial land, should be devoted to nature conservation and should be left to nature. And that would be okay if that land could be continued to manage by pastoralists and other indigenous peoples then that would be fine. I mean, that, that that would be great if that land would be left alone and, uh, you know, no further, no damaging development would take place. But that's probably not what's going to happen. There's conservationists coming in there and then maybe kicking out the pastors and so on. So it's a very dangerous situation. 
But, uh, I mean, there is some hope because 2026 is the International Year of Rangeland and Pastoralists, and that, I think, will provide an opportunity for highlighting the, the benefits of pastoralists and their importance for, for managing rangeland and other biologically rich environments uh, sustainably. And there's a huge global movement now preparing for that international year. There are like seven regional groups. They already, they're mapping out all the activities that they're going to do in 2026. So we just have to hope that a change in thinking will happen at that point in time. Well, and that's part of why you wrote this book is to make this whole world of pastoralists available to listeners to to this show and to readers like us. Yes, because, I mean, you have the, you know, the, there's this big movement for regenerative grazing, which is regarded as progressive. And basically that movement, that regenerative grazing, they are adopting the same principles as pastors have been practicing for thousands of years. So they have, uh, you know, one of their methods is what is called adaptive multi-paddock grazing, which means you divide a, a certain area into little pieces and which are fenced in by electrical fences. And then you move your animals uh, maybe daily from one small place to the next and the next and the next. And pastors they don't have electrical fencing or anything. They just keep moving. They herd the animals. And that may actually, that's probably even better than this adaptive multi grazing, I would think. So there are so many similarities, I think, between regenerative graziers and the traditional pastels. And they need to join together to create a really strong movement and make the world realize uh, how important moving animals are for the future of the planet. You've been to conferences where grazers and pastoralists from all over the world get together. Do they, I mean, they don't necessarily have languages in common, but are they able to kind of communicate and understand each other? Well, they they do. I mean, actually, no, the conference, I've, I've never been to a conference where both, you know, the, the new, the, the regenerative graziers and pastors were together. But that's exactly what we have to arrange in the future. Uh, but I have been to, there have been a, quite a few conferences where pastors from all over the world, including one conference where it was only pastoralist women, they came together and they talk to each other and I find even though the languages are totally different and they can't uh, you know com- communicate verbally but they all have like the same attitude and they can communicate like pastors can communicate with their animals so they can also communicate with people uh, from different cultures who don't have the same verbal language so there is a there's an immediate connection I think between uh, pastors all over the world There's a generation of young people now who are in Western countries, in Europe, who don't necessarily have a background in agriculture, but they want to get out of the corporate system. They want to learn to be herders and butchers and and grazers and things like that. What does that look like? And what do you see as the potential of that in this whole, like, looking forward to a healthier food system? I mean, that that is really very encouraging that all you know there are a lot of shepherding schools now in Spain and in France where young people with no background at all try to learn the the craft basically and it's it's totally understandable that you know you prefer to be out there with animals than looking at a computer screen the whole day but at the same time it's still very difficult to make a living as a shepherd in Germany or in other european countries because there are a lot of bureaucratic things you have to take care of. The life is made very difficult for you from the policies. You don't earn enough income. And we, we also, we, we need to realize that, I mean, working, you know, if, if you have a herd of animals to take care of, it's a, like a 24-7 job and you never get a holiday, really. Because you always have to lead out your animals to graze and so on. So uh, even if you're not well, if you're sick, uh, I mean, there's no excuse. The animals have to go out and graze. And so it's it's also a hard job. It's a job. Um, it's not a job, but it's a. It takes a lot out of you. It has a lot of rewards as well, but it's also something that's not easy to do and to do your whole life. So we we also need to explore ways where it's being made easier to do this. And for that, we also need more government support, more uh, realization 
about the value of the work that that is being done and uh, you know conservationists or rangers they get a lot of appreciation for the wonderful work they're doing and shepherds they don't and that has to change shepherds uh, or pastors they are the ones who know how to produce food in tune with nature i mean they do both jobs they produce food for us and they take care of nature and that really that needs to get appreciated i forget exactly how you put it in the book but it was something like pastoralism is the most efficient way to take carbon from above the ground and to sequester it below the ground and at the same time produce very healthy meat and dairy that's quite right i mean that's exactly that's another important point uh, of the relevance of pastoralism to the whole climate scenario both i mean pastoralism by grazing you we can uh, sequester carbon uh, below the ground and at the same time it's also so, so i mean if you talk climate there's always climate adaptation and there's climate mitigation and so climate adaptation in terms of climate adaptation pastoralists are brilliant because their animals they, they can take the heat and i mean they're I think they're better suited than anybody else to cope with climate change. And at the same time, they can also mitigate climate change by sequestering carbon under the ground. Now, this is this is a very this is still a very contentious uh, debate because I mean there's problems of metricizing how much carbon is actually being sequestered, and there are big financial interests in that as well. So la- you know land is being bought up to use it for carbon sequestration etc cetera, etc cetera. so i mean it's it's a very tricky issue but it seems to be that through appropriate and skilled grazing you can actually sequester much more carbon under the ground than by by any other uh, method yeah i mean this is a big it's a huge issue where there's a lot of potential but i also i see the huge danger of this totally becoming you know going into the hands of again some big uh, corporate guys and um there is for instance there is a project in northern kenya uh by the northern range i think it's called the northern rangeland trust or so where it's an organization that is giving carbon credits to big companies uh, so they can continue to pollute the environment and and generate uh, greenhouse gases and in turn so and this organization has is working with pastors to sequester more carbon and they have adapted i think told the pastors to to graze their animals in a certain way to sequester more carbon etc and it apparently it's it is a big scam as well and uh, the pastors have been negatively affected so uh, i mean this this is a big thing that we need to really watch out for and see what happens. Well, and it it plays into the whole problem of what's genuinely workable for a very sick and endangered planet that we're living on right now and what is, you know, what's just false. I mean, we have in the United States this crazy system where this very fertile land of the Midwestern prairie is used to grow grains to feed livestock And as you wrote in your book, there's more protein in their animal feed that goes into an animal that comes out in their meat. So that's like a a crazy negative input output. Yeah, that's totally crazy. And that that so interestingly enough, I mean, there are statistics on this provided by the Food and Agriculture Organization, and they show that in countries with large pastoralist populations, like Kenya and Ethiopia, livestock produces like twenty ta- up to twenty times as much protein as it consumes because the livestock only eats like this really shrubby stuff, uh, high fiber content, natural vegetation, and in the U.S. Uh, livestock actually, I think it consumes twice as much protein as it actually produces in the end. So it's it's a totally nonsensical system. And in addition to that, you have um, very high transportation costs and you have fossil fuel based fertilizers and you have all the runoff from that, which is polluting the rivers and the oceans. And so and, and yet that is touted as efficiency. Yes, 
Exactly. So this is the thing. The paradigm in, in the conventional animal science is a natural resource use efficiency. But I'm getting more and more the feeling it's not really properly defined at all. I mean, so basically it is how much feed you put into the animal and how much food in milk or in meat you get out of it. So that's a basic calculation. And if you just look at that, then the industrial systems are more uh, productive or more efficient. But that way of thinking, it ignores all the negative negative externalities that are, that are associated with it. Uh, I mean, the, the animal welfare issues, the pollution, the, uh, the, the fossil fuel use and all that. Um, so it's definitely not a holistic approach. And that really needs to be recognized by the animal science community. And it's, again, I mean, it's the big corporates who keep saying that our systems are the most efficient. And scientists have kind of fallen in line with that. So they, in effect, promote those industrial systems. And that really, that's what upsets me with the animal science, scientific world. Uh, so there are also people who, you know, who work on rangelands, they have a much more holistic perspective. But the, the, the narrow animal science, they just, uh, I mean, they are responsible for, I think, for the dire situation in many ways by having such a reductionist approach. Is there anything that, for example, our listeners or people who are reading your book can do like what would if somebody says well you know i want to take action what i want to help pastoral people around the world i want to encourage regenerative grazing here what can they do so i think one of the most important uh, ways of doing is to source your food from uh, such systems so so many young people are going vegan uh, because they they think it's not ethical to eat livestock products. And uh, it's true. I mean, if you eat livestock products from industrial systems, then, uh, yeah, one should avoid that as much as possible. But it's a different thing if you buy the products from animals that are uh, ethically kept and in tune with the environment and that have a good life, then that's totally different. If people are vegan, that's abs that's absolutely fine. But I, I think nobody has to be because we are consuming too many livestock products on a global basis. But it's absolutely fine to also consume products from ethical livestock systems. And that's an important way of supporting that those systems because we also have to realize i mean we can't just grow plants natural systems are composed of plants and animals and our farming system has to mimic those natural ecosystems of which animals are a part so we can't take livestock out of the farming equation it's absolutely impossible but we need to make sure that livestock is kept in line uh, with the availability, you know, it should be kept on locally available resources. You shouldn't import the feed from the, the other side of the world. It should be used to metabolize whatever is available in terms of crop byproducts and natural vegetation into food. And that's the right approach. So somebody also has to need buy and consume the, those products. So what I'm advocating for is limit your consumption of livestock products to those that come out of these ethical systems. Is there anything else you want to talk about or let people know before we go? Yeah, so my work uh, here in India, so it started off being 30 years ago, it just started off with documenting and trying to understand this traditional system. And initially, we worked on grazing rights and on animal health, camel health care. And now we're at the stage where we have set up this dairy this a specialized micro camel dairy to create income for the pastors and to main the camels as a part of the landscape. And we are developing this concept of compassionate or cruelty-free milk dairy. So and our criteria for that is that the babies are not separated from their mothers. The camels are kept in a nomadic system so they can move around and they can select their diet to, to some extent. They have a close relationship with their herder as well. So, so those, that's our concept of cruelty-free and compassionate. So yeah, so we depend also on people to buy our camel milk. And we have a website called camelcharisma.com. And there it's also possible to make donations of camel milk. 
So that enables us to buy camel milk from the herder, keep camel herding families in business. And at the same time, we give away that milk for free to undernourished children here in the area. So if, if you want to support this work, yeah, that's a possibility. And also keep, I mean, so this International Year of Ranger and Pastoralists is coming up. And so keep your eyes open for that. And we will, God willing, cover that on this program as well when the time comes in 2026. Oh, and another thing, you know, then what is coming up in 2024 is the International Year of Camelids. So that's what we're actually busy with right now, preparing for that. So we're going to hold a, a workshop of camel pastors, communities here in Rajasthan in the first week of January 2024. And uh, we want to discuss camel well-being and how can you tell a camel is happy and in good conditions. And we want to discuss this with people who come from traditional pastors communities and uh, modern camel farmers. Camels have so far escaped becoming industrialized because they are an animal of nomads. So they haven't gone the way that chicken and pigs and cattle have gone. But the tendency is there too now. And there are these big camel farms with thousands of camels have been set up in the Gulf countries. And a lot of research, again, is focusing on that way. So our goal for the International Year of Camelids is to avoid the mistakes that have been made with the more conventional livestock and to ensure it is kept in pastoral systems in the future as well. Ilse, thank you so much for being with us on Down to Earth. No, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to say something about my views. I really appreciate it. It's been great fun. The book is called Hoofprints on the Land by Ilse Köhler Rolofsson. And if you're in the U.S., you can get it with a 35% discount at chelseagreen.com. Just use the code CGP35 at checkout, and we'll put a link to it in the show notes. And to find out more about Ilsa's work with the camels, you can go to camelcharisma.com. You've been listening to Down to Earth. We would love it if you would support this program, which you can do by going to patreon.com slash down to earth planet to plate, where you can sign up for as little as $3. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And also please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The Kivira Coalition is a not-for-profit and a community network of ranchers, farmers, conservationists, scientists, educators, and many others dedicated to regenerative practices that produce healthy food, support meaningful livelihoods, sustain biodiversity, and remedy the impacts of climate change. To learn more about Kivira and how you can support their work, visit kiviracoalition.org, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. And finally, this show is a production with the Radio Cafe. You can check out radiocafe.org to hear back episodes of this show and also find all kinds of other shows on a wide variety of topics as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.